In the 90s, it was almost unheard of for a Western company to develop a Japanese-style role-playing game. Whilst Western developers did make role-playing games, they had their own distinct flavour, were generally darker and grittier in tone, and tended to draw heavily from pop culture reference points such as Dungeons and & Dragons and the works of J.R.R. Tolkien. There was the Western developed JRPG on the Super Nintendo Entertainment System, Secret of Evermore, which was developed by Squaresoft, however it was stylized around the popular Secret of Mana. It wasn't until 1999 that Graveyard Studios launched forward all pistons thrusting with their bold release of Shadow Madness exclusively in the West for the Sony PlayStation. Graveyard Studios was headed by Ted Woolsey, which is important to note as he had previously worked at Squaresoft and was detrimental to many of their games coming west with an English translation between 1991 and 1996. You would expect that due to his involvement in the proliferation of JRPGs in the west, that Shadow Madness would also be successful. Well, you'd be wrong. Shadow Madness places us in the shoes of Stinger, a boy who happened to be away from his town when tragedy struck. Returning to his hometown, he witnesses its destruction and is surprised to find that the people who survived the carnage have succumbed to a spreading madness. As he explores the town ruins, he encounters Windleaf, a woman who claims to be from a village to the north which has suffered a similar fate. The two join together to get to the bottom of the mystery, beginning a trip that will take them to Carillion, the largest city on the continent, to request help from the National Army. One thing that I will note as a strength of the game is the way in which its narrative is delivered. Due to the fact that it was written with an English audience in mind, the dialogue is well executed and includes spatters of humour that come across naturally, and even had me chuckling a few times. Whilst the story itself isn't anything new, the amount of lore contained within the game helps to flesh it out, in the form of books that you can read at the various locations around the world. Though I should note that sometimes it is a little excessive, and many of the terms you will end up forgetting, as there is no in-game compendium that collects all this information that you are overloaded with. On the topic of collating information, let's talk about menus. This game is riddled with them. I can't quite understand why the game was programmed in this way. On the field alone, there are four separate menus that you can open with different button presses. Select, for example, opens a menu that allows you to view your key items, as well as save the game, provided that you are on the world map. Cross, Triangle, and Square all open their own different menus corresponding to equipment, items, and magic. Why couldn't these all have been grouped into one menu like other games of the era, instead of making me open and close them like the toilet door of a full capacity long haul flight? Regarding inventory, you can only ever carry 30 types of items at a time, and if you are at limit, you either need to throw away or use existing items. The inventory limit applies to both items and equipment, so you need to carefully manage what you decide to collect, which can be a difficult task given that many of the items that you find along the adventure have no real purpose. Were healing items that only heal 1 HP, or useless junk items really necessary? When buying new equipment from stores, there is no comparison to reference to tell if the equipment you are about to purchase is better than what you have equipped, which can sometimes result in unnecessary purchases. And there is no mass storage place where you can dump excess items, like in Grandia, so you often have to break the flow of your gameplay just to juggle items around in order to pick up the ones that you may think you need from the environment. For all the great dialogue that the game presents, there are an equal number of flaws to Shadow Madness which, depending on the player, can make the game almost unbearable. Whilst I have already covered a few flaws, I feel that I should move on to the biggest elephant in the room, the battle system. To start with, the instructions delivered within the game and the instruction booklet claim that you may avoid battles by holding the R2 and L2 buttons simultaneously when you hear a monster roar in the field. However, this never seemed to work for me, so I was always thrust into battle every time I heard that gurgle in the darkness. At least on the plus side, you can flee from battle with 100% efficiency, unless, of course, it's a boss. The battle system itself is where the game really falls apart. Whilst it is styled after a Japanese role-playing game with your characters lined up on the right and the enemy on the left, the way the battles are executed left me extremely frustrated. You generally have three people in your party, two of which typically tend to be close combat fighters, with one long-range character. Shadow Madness utilizes a system whereby everything is active, 
but all actions are communicated to characters via a menu system. When it is a character's turn you need to select what to do, be it attack, use magic or use an item for example. If a melee character is too far from the enemy, they will use their turn to move a little closer. The ranged characters all differ in their capabilities. Wind Leaf can only attack at range if she has arrows, Zero can attack irrespective of what resources you have, and Clement's ranged attacks use his MP. This is all well and good, however I found that the characters often missed the enemy, even the close range combatants, when I used a twitch attack, a button press that when timed correctly can double the amount of damage dealt. The HP cap is 999 which also applies to all monsters including bosses. So you'll find that two swings of Stinger's Blade, two of Windleaf's arrows and perhaps a kick from Jirina for example, is enough to fell even the toughest of bosses. The game is just too easy. I never felt any anxiety at any point of the game, except where Craveyard Studios decided that it would be a good idea to include timed escape sequences, where the clock continues to count down in battle, and also in the transition from the field screen to the battle screen, which seemed a little unfair. I understand that the game had a long development time and funding was limited, so I can only come to the conclusion that this is the reason these oversights exist. It feels almost as though there was a conflict of interest amongst the development team, and no one could quite decide just how to streamline everything, so just left it the way it was. If I were to fine tune the system, I would change the active battle system to a grid based turn based style to retain the movement capabilities of allies and enemies. I'd also make it so that the HP cap wasn't 999, and scaled as you progress through the game, making sure to distribute treasure in the form of useful weapons and armour that would assist a weary player. I'd also make spells cost less and not provide them 3 at a time at each level up. Finally, I'd make the status effects actually have consequences, requiring the use of spells or items to remove. Looking at the game objectively, it seems like if it was given a little more care, or more of a chance, or more development time, then it could have been something great. One of my university guest lecturers once said, You can polish a turd as much as you like. It will never turn into a diamond. Regarding writing. I feel like whilst this may not necessarily apply in this case, the game could have been something amazing if it was incubated on a little more, or if the development team had a bit more experience with developing games, because unfortunately for many of the staff, this was their first attempt. The other thing that doesn't really work well in Shadow Madness is its levels. There are a total of 16 for each character which are spread across disciplines in groups of 4. It isn't difficult to reach the maximum level early, and then have no need of combat, as the experience gained once reaching max level is 0. I found that when I got to this point I just ran away from every battle, as I didn't need the experience or money. Outside of the main plot there isn't really anything extra to do other than a Doom like game that left me feeling a little dizzy after playing it. If you didn't know that the game was American produced then you'd certainly know from this. Not to mention that the cast in general is just not the typical type you'd find in a Japanese developed game. Sure you have the typical protagonist and the heroine, but then a scarecrow and a floating head? Not to mention that the women all seem to be wearing knickers into battle and nothing else to cover their nether regions. It makes me wonder if there were any women working on the development team, or if a woman was consulted before the game was released, as the designs of Windleaf and Jirina seem to be very impractical for combat and long travel. The game also includes a rudimentary lockpicking system which is accessible if Stinger is in the party, however it is used very rarely and is almost forgettable. The other characters all have their specific skills, like how Clement will gain new types of gun ammunition when he levels up, or Half 5 gains immunity to various status ailments, which doesn't really mean much when status effects never really did much to begin with. On the topic of design, I did like that the game was presented in 3D pre-rendered backgrounds, though the amount of compression done to the images makes them a little grainy, and it can sometimes be difficult to locate the exits of some areas. Navigation of these maps was also a little clunky, and I'd often find my character getting stuck on invisible asset edges that shouldn't have been there. As the character only moves in 8 directions, it can sometimes be difficult to navigate any winding corridors, slopes or caverns. CGI cutscenes are used scarcely throughout the narrative, but some of them are reversed and don't really add anything to the experience, like the gondola ride. In battle the backdrops, as well as the characters and monsters are uninspired blocky 3D, and the field models don't fare much better. To the game's credit it does use art in the text boxes to help identify the speaker, but the art itself isn't my cup of tea. 
Where the game does stand well on its own is the music design. There are so many tracks and also a variety of battle tracks which cycle out so you'll never get bored. For a game that only took me around 20 hours to beat, I was quite surprised by the number of tracks that it contained. Most of the time the songs are appropriate, and some of the battle themes even had me bopping along. My favourite song would have to be the one played in Pei's Hong. It has a creepy, somewhat melancholy vibe which embodies the oppression of the people of the underworld who are forced to slave away in mines for the purposes of fulfilling someone's evil goal. The tone of the song just hits right for that point of the game, and you'll find that this happens a lot throughout your journey. So kudos to the composer Brad Spear for accomplishing this feat. With a myriad of problems that just kept stacking up one after the other as I played, Shadow Madness became an exercise of endurance to see it through to the end. Where other games I could sit and play for three hours at a time, this one was lucky to even get an hour per sitting. Whilst the dialogue is strong and the way it's delivered made me laugh a few times, it wasn't enough to save the sinking ship of a game riddled with menu, battle system, and graphical problems. I wouldn't recommend playing this game unless you were raving mad, in which case I suppose would mean that the forces of darkness had won. There will be death. By the way, what is your least favourite game of your favourite genre? Let me know in the comments. This has been Venoir with a review of Shadow Madness for the Sony PlayStation. If you enjoyed this review, please feel free to like and subscribe for more great JRPG content. As always, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to watch this video, and I hope to see you all again soon. Take care, and bye bye for now.